Adults, please turn with me over into the Gospel of Matthew in the 8th chapter. Matthew chapter 8. Praise the Lord. Amen. And we will begin reading there in verse 5. Matthew chapter 8 and verse 5. Praise the Lord. Amen. You glad to be in the house of God today? Praise the Lord God. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 8, beginning with verse 5. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. Now, literally, though, it's, it's a question. When you read it in the King James, it makes it a statement, right? Where Jesus said uh, unto him, I will come and heal him. It's really a question. So it changes really the way it's supposed to be read. Jesus is actually asking them, shall I come? Shall I come? So all, already the Lord is putting an obstacle here to this miracle. The Lord himself is. Because he's asking, shall I come? Okay. So, so you see that. Verse 8. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. So you see the centurion overcomes the obstacle of shall I come by faith. Amen. Verse 9. He says, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh. And to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you. We ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy words. We give you all praise and all glory and honor for it. Speak in and through it to us today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Praise God. The title of the message today is Walking in Kingdom Authority. Walking in Kingdom Authority. Amen. Praise the Lord. So we have been teaching you the Gospel of Matthew and the fifth and the sixth and the seventh chapter of the Gospel of Matthew was the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus the King is coming off the mountain after giving his disciples kingdom instructions, kingdom laws, if you will. And after he comes off the mountain, he will work ten miracles. So what you have is a parallel with the Old Testament to where we had the ten plagues of Egypt, etc. Okay. So the same God that worked those miracles that brought Israel out of Egypt is the one that has come down off the mountain in human form. So he is going to do ten miracles beginning in the eighth chapter through the ninth chapter uh, among nine miracle stories. But in those nine miracle stories, there are ten miracles. So there's a parallel going on here. So the king has come down off the mountain after giving his instruction concerning the kingdom of God. Amen. Uh, the orthodoxy, if you will, which is the teaching of the king. Now, as he comes off of the mountain, he's going to enter into orthopraxy, which is the practice of the ministry. In order for us to have a church that is, is properly founded, we must have orthodoxy, which is truth, which tells people how to be saved. But we also must have orthopraxy, which means we must minister to people. So we have the Word of God, amen, that brings us salvation. We need to preach that. But we also need to be involved in ministering to people, amen. Praise the Lord. 
So this is what Jesus does. He comes off the mountain after giving them the orthodoxy or the teaching as the king. Now in the 8th and ninth chapter, he is going to put that into practice, into ministry, orthopraxy. Praise the Lord. Amen. So oftentimes, when we come to the church, that's what we do. We'll bring you the Word of God, and then we'll bring you up to the altars, etc., and we'll minister to you, we'll pray for you, etc., and we'll trust God to minister to your life, because that is a part of a true biblical church. You must have both of them. Today, what you have a lot of times is, for example, on in television ministry or radio ministry, you have orthopraxy. And what that is basically is somebody will tell you, if you send me a, you know, a certain amount of money, then we'll believe for God to do something for you. Very rarely do you ever hear orthodoxy from television ministries. Amen. They'll talk about what God will do for you, orthopraxy, but very rarely... Will you ever hear somebody tell you the truth and how to be saved? And so today the church in some aspects is very negligent as to the way we are supposed to approach things. Amen. You also though must be a church that doesn't preach the truth only. But you must minister to people. Lay hands on the sick. They shall recover etc. etc. So now when we look at these miracles we already saw the leopard the one that Jesus healed last week. Now we're going to talk about this centurion that Jesus is going to heal his servant. Praise the Lord. Amen. When you look at the Word of God and authority here that we're going to study today, it's a very powerful thing. And, uh, but before we get into that, the Bible says again in verse 5, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. I don't know if you know this, but every time that the Word of God in the New Testament mentions a centurion, it always is with honors every time. In fact, even the centurion that stood at the foot of Jesus' cross, uh, cross when he died said, Surely this was the Son of God. Amen. So every time the New Testament talks about a centurion, it always said something in honor in relationship to them. Now, a centurion is somebody who was over a hundred soldiers. He was over the occupational force okay, of Rome. So he was a man of rank. Now, he would have had superiors over him, right? Starting with the emperor, the emperor at the top. Then you come on down. There's a hierarchy of authority. Do you understand that? There's a hierarchy. There's a rank in authority. So it starts with the emperor, the Caesar, etc. It comes on down. Now, from the emperor underneath there, you would have some very high-ranking military officials. Those high-ranking military officials were basically royalty. Okay, so you, again, you come from come down from the Caesar to the you know the emperor on down to high-ranking officials. They're like royalty. Okay, but underneath these, like the emperor, the high-ranking officials, underneath them, you would have a centurion, and a centurion was a common man, but he had rose up through the ranks. He's sort of like in the middle. He doesn't really have a relationship with the high-ranking officials, the high-ranking soldiers. He can't fraternize with them. And here he is. He's a, he's a, 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 ca a captain, basically, over 100 soldiers. So he can't fraternize with the soldiers. So when you look at this man, he's in a place, he's sort of in a situation where he doesn't have friends. Not only that, as a centurion, he could not marry for 20 years. So he has to be totally dedicated uh, to, the, to being a soldier, to being a centurion. So for 20 years, this man could not be married. So he is without family, and basically, he is without friends. Okay? Now, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 7, though, he was a man that feared God. Even though he was a Roman centurion, he feared God. Now, think about that. In the midst of all the paganism of the Romans... And Roman soldiers, etc. This centurion here was different. Because he, he feared God Almighty. The Bible also says about this centurion. That he actually took out of his own pocket money. And he paid for a synagogue to be built for the Jews. Now if you think about that. The way the Jews and the Romans hated each other. This Roman centurion who feared God. Evidently was motivated by love. And he defeated hate by love. By buying, paying out of his own pocket uh, for a synagogue that was built there. 
And so now the Bible tells us he's got this servant. Again, remember, no doubt at this point he's not married. But he has a servant in his household. The Greek word there, pas, means that it's like a child to him. This servant is a very, very beloved servant in his house. It's like family to him. And so the centurion, he gathers the elders of the Jews and he asked them to go on his behalf to talk to Jesus, to see if Jesus would do something for his servant. So the elders of that city there go to Jesus and say, this man is a good man. This man fears God. This man built us a synagogue and he's worthy that you would do something for him. Amen. And so the Bible says, Matthew doesn't give us all these details. It just gets straight to the miracle. But the scripture tells us here again in verse 5, that when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion beseeching him. Now, even though this man has, has rank and authority in the Roman armies, he humbles himself on the behalf of his servant. Okay? Amen. And so the Bible says, verse 6, uh, the centurion beseeching him. And again, this is coming through the elders, etc. Verse 6 saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, so now the conversation is between Jesus and the centurion. And uh, so Jesus saith unto him, well, I, I will come and heal him. Or literally, shall I come and heal him? It's a question. And the point is that Jesus being a Jew, if Jesus walks into the presence or into the house of a centurion, that house would be considered unclean. Now think about the leopard that has already been cured or, or been cleansed in the previous miracle. That leper was unclean as well, right? So we're dealing with unclean situations. So for Jesus to step into the house of that centurion as a Jew would make him ceremonially unclean. And this Roman soldier, this Roman centurion understood that. So when Jesus asked him the question, shall I come? The Roman soldier understood what Jesus as a Jew was saying. That if I go in your house, I will become ceremonially unclean. Amen. And so let's see, Jesus says, shall I come? Now, already we've got an obstacle. Jesus is questioning this man, shall I come into your house? Shall I work this miracle for you? Amen. And look at the response of, uh, amen, uh, this centurion. How he overcomes this obstacle uh, by faith. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. But speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. Wow. See, this in turn, in the previous miracle, we saw Jesus, orthopraxy, touching the leper and speaking to the leper. The leper was cleansed, right? Now, Jesus is showing you that he doesn't even have to touch you. That by his word, he can bring a miracle. And, and this centurion understood that. Now, think about that. Where this centurion is, the kind of faith that this man had. That he looks at Jesus and said, all you have to do is speak a word. And I know my servant will be healed. You don't have to come into my house. You don't have to touch him. All you have to do is speak a word. And the authority that is in that word will travel distance. Amen. And work a miracle. Even though there's distance. That distance, that authority of God's word will travel that distance. Distance and work a miracle. And the reason why this centurion knew that is because the emperor or the Caesar's word traveled with authority. Did you hear what I said? The, the Caesar, the emperor's word traveled with authority. And he is a man under authority, under Caesar's authority, knew that Caesar's authority was with him. So that what he said, Caesar's authority backed it. So the centurion understood it, understood delegated authority. So he knew all Jesus had to do was speak the word. Now listen to me. We understand that as a church, but this is a Roman centurion. We understand as the people of God that this is a voice-activated kingdom. 
Did you hear what I say? It's a voice activated kingdom. So that when you and I worship God, you're activating something in the spirit. When the word of God is preached, you are activating something in the spirit. When the word of God is preached, the presence of God is in that word. When I stand up here today and I declare the word of God to you and that word goes forth, it's not just words off of a page. The presence of God is in that word. And we understand that, that this is a voice activated kingdom. So we say in the name of Jesus and miracles begin to take place because we know even though we don't see him, under this roof today we know that he's actively present here that he's actively here to help us and to be involved in our lives even though we don't see him and by the word of God miracles can take place it doesn't matter how far they are amen that's why we can pray right here in Odessa Texas we can pray for the church in Taiwan and that word, because it travels, the authority of the word there, it travels all the way to Taiwan and does something there in Taiwan. Give God praise in the house because we are a part of a voice-activated kingdom. Say praise the Lord God. And so this centurion understood that because he knew that when Caesar spoke, that things moved in the kingdom of Rome. He knew all, all the emperor had to do was say a word and then people would begin to put in action what the Caesar wanted. And so because he was under authority, he was under Caesar's authority, he knew that he had authority. So that when he spoke as a centurion, that Caesar was behind him. That all the Roman Empire was behind him. And so he said to Jesus, he said, only speak the word and I know my servant will be healed. Say praise God. Amen. And so the Bible says, verse 9, he said, For I am a man under authority. He recognized the power of being under authority. Amen. Say praise the Lord. And he said this, Having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh into my servant. Do this, and he doeth it. He said, I recognize delegated authority. That when I speak a word, people move when that word is spoken. And he said, the reason why they do is not because of me as a man. Not because of me as a human being. But because of the rank that I have. And because I'm underneath authority. Say praise God. Delegated authority. Now, there is a difference between power and... And authority. When you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The, Jesus said this. You shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. That word power dunamis means dynamic ability. Ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost. You'll begin to do things with dynamic ability. But having the Holy Ghost uh, enables you to do things in the kingdom of God. That are supernatural. They're dynamic ability. Amen. But authority is more than power. Authority is a different kind of word. It's exousia. So let me explain to you the difference. Exousia, he says, when he talks about authority in the passage, the Greek word is exousia, authority. Now, you may have power to do something. You may have knowledge to do something. But you may not be authorized to do it. Or you understand what I'm telling you today. So for example, if you go to the doctor, you may have the same knowledge about a certain medication that the doctor has. You may know more than the doctor knows about a certain treatment. But you don't have the authority to prescribe for yourself the medication. You don't have the credentials. I sat down with my doctor not long ago, and I was talking about uh, certain treatments, you know, that I was interested in, and it's, it's peptides, and I'm not going to get into all of that, but he didn't know much about peptides, and I sat down and began to talk to him about peptides, and to, to make a long story short now, he is starting a practice uh, uh, working with peptides, 
And it all came about uh, with me sitting down and talking to him about this treatment. So now he's going that direction. Uh, I sat down with him not long ago, and we were talking about these different treatments. And, and uh, so to make a long story short, I might have some knowledge about the peptides, but I can't prescribe them. And that's what I told my doctor. I said, I might have a certain knowledge about a certain treatment, but I don't have the credentials. You got the credentials. I can't go around prescribing medications to people, so I need you in the loop. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. I, I might have some knowledge, and, and I can tell some people about, you know, these things. But, doctor, I'm sending to you because you have the authority or the credentials to practice medicine. I don't say praise the Lord. Amen. You understand the difference. So you might have the Holy Ghost today. You have received the Spirit of God, so you have ability. You have dynamic ability, power. Miracles can break out all around you. But there's a difference when you have authority. Because authority is authorization. Say praise the Lord. Authority means this exousia and the words connected to it. I'm going somewhere. Don't lose me this morning. Exousia means to be free or uninhibited. Woo! It means to work by permission. It means that you have been given the permission to do something. So exousia is the power to do something without anything getting in the way. Because you've been authorized, you've been given permission, you have the freedom in order to do it. Say, I'm free. I'm free. When you have authority, you are free. Say, praise the Lord. Amen. And so when you have authority, you are not inhibited. There's nothing in the way because somebody, some superior, has given you the permission to do something. It's not just the ability to do something. You have the right to do it. You have the authority to do it. You have the authorization to do it. Say praise God. Amen. So authority to me is greater than just the power to do something. Are y'all awake today? You will come across people who have the Holy Ghost. They have the gifts of the Spirit. But that doesn't mean that they have authority. Authority is different. You will come across certain people in your life. And when you get in their, in their presence, it's not that you see miracles breaking out all around them. Or that you feel, you know, goosebumps on your arms when you get around them. It's not that. But there's something in your spirit, if you're a child of God, that you know when you're in their presence, this person is a person of rank in the kingdom of God. They don't just have the ability to do miracles. They've got authorization to work in the kingdom. Say praise the Lord. And not everybody has the same rank and the same authority in the kingdom of God. Everybody has the Holy Ghost. And if you're baptized in Jesus' name, you're authorized to use that name. Everybody awake. But that doesn't mean that you have the same authority as everybody else. Because somebody, are y'all with me today, has authorized that individual to do certain things. And when they have that authorization, they can move freely and do whatever they want to do without being inhibited. Say praise the Lord. And that comes because the person is under delegated authority. This man knew because he was under delegated authority. He recognized the power of delegated authority. Because he knew that when he was under authority, rightly related to authority. That means he was walking in obedience to the authority that he was in his life. He knew that that brought authority to him. Say praise God. So he was under Caesar's authority. But Caesar's authority was in him. Because Caesar had given him that authorization. And so when this man began to speak and tell his soldier to do certain things, he knew that all of Rome was behind him, authorizing his ability to do that or to say that. Is everybody hearing what I'm telling you today? 